Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Joppe Bos. Joppe Bos is a cryptographic researcher in the Competence Center Crypto and Security at NXP Semiconductors Leuven in Belgium. He's the technical lead of the post-quantum cryptography team and manager of the crypto concepts uh, team. Joppe was a postdoctoral researcher in the cryptography research group at Microsoft Research and obtained his PhD in the laboratory for cryptographic algorithms at EPFL uh, under the supervision of Arjen Lenstra. His research focuses on high-performance ar uh, arithmetic, uh, computational number theory, as used in post-quantum public key cryptography. Uh, Joppe is also co-author of the post-quantum secure Crystal Skyber key encapsulation mechanism, which has been selected by NIST for standardization. Please, Joppe, the floor is yours. Good morning. You can hear me well? Very good. It's hard to hear over here. Um, yeah, today I want to talk a bit about embedded applications. Um, of course, that is what we at NXP are mainly looking at. And I think already the main takeaway is, because we have seen all the great summaries yesterday, and I, I really liked all the great talks yesterday, uh, the benchmarks, but also the applications. But the crypto is used not only in TLS. I think that is... One of the main things uh, I want to make clear, and as TLS is a very important use case, also in embedded applications, but for us in the embedded world, I think applications like Secure Boot or Secure Update are also uh, paramount. And there, I think, with all the constraints, uh, things are a bit different. So the outline, so that is roughly what I want to talk about. I really want to look at the impact of post-quantum crypto uh, from an embedded perspective. So what does that mean, the embedded perspective? Um, and hopefully yeah, in this 30 minutes, I can make that a little bit uh, clearer. So maybe since I was the first talk, I thought, let's recap some of the things you have seen many, many times. Uh, yesterday, I will try to go over it quickly. So we have NIST, of course, running the standardization. And again, it's important because I think when I talk to customers, there's a lot of confusion that even though NIST ran this uh, and they are in a US organization, this is really considered by industry to be a worldwide standard. Uh, it's not really an American standard only. So like, for instance, that AES and SHA-3 are also not considered just a US standard. So we have our two main algorithms, Kyber and Dilithium. Um, they are the, the recommended algorithms. And then, of course, as we saw yesterday, we have two more algorithms which will get standardized, Falcon and Sphinx Plus. Um, but for reasons, and I will go into it a little bit deeper for us, what we are mainly focusing on are um, the two algorithms, one for key exchange, one for digital signatures. And these are Kyber and Dilithium. Then we saw that everything gets way more complicated. Um, there is a round four, there is another competition uh, or call for standardization currently ongoing. Let's not, I mean, for industry, this is interesting to follow, but I think to prepare ourselves, and that's why we're here, right, to prepare for this migration to post-quantum crypto, we mainly focus on Kyber and Dilithium, of course, extended with these stateful schemes. Uh, we heard about yesterday as well, LMS and XMSS. Uh, and then to a lesser extent, of course, Falcon and Sphinx Plus. And then I think it's also good because at least I did not hear that in, I only was in this room yesterday um, and I didn't hear that clearly. So some of the other activities were mentioned um, besides what NIST was doing. Of course, we have the preference of some of the European partners. Um, so we are very active in ISO as well to get Frodo Chem um, standardized. Of course, I'm slightly biased because I'm also a co-author of Frodo Chem. Um, but on the other hand, for embedded, I would say that's probably not the perfect match. Um, it's, it's definitely too big for some of our embedded applications. Um, but besides this European view, of course, we should not forget about Asia. I mean, China um, is expected to have their own post-quantum crypto. 
standard. And then, of course, there is a currently a standardization ongoing in South Korea, um, which is expected to end by November next year. So then we have another post-quantum crypto standards to worry about. And for industry, of course, the more is uh, definitely not the better, because it's more work to maintain um, and investigate all these schemes and put them in your crypto libraries. But these are just the low-level algorithms. And of course, they are all integrated into protocols. Um, yeah, I cannot list all the protocols which will be using them. There are many. I just mentioned some of them. TLS, of course, is, is one of the most important ones. We saw that yesterday. But for the embedded world, there are many other um, ISO standards where this will have an impact. And working groups are ramping up all over the place to prepare themselves for these new standards. But besides standardization, and I think we saw this yesterday, um, there are all the migration documents, and I think I will not dwell on this because I think um, the representatives of all these three did an amazing job yesterday summarizing their view on their guidance in the migration. But what does this mean for um, the migration for embedded applications in practice? So let's take a key exchange algorithm, let's take a signature algorithm, as the primary new PQC standards. And then we want to transition starting next year, because then only the standard comes out. Um, and our focus, if I say embedded, is mainly on industrial and IoT, and also the combination industrial IoT, on the one hand, where we expect many, many units um, which need to run secure connections. And of course, I'm talking about automotive, where um, yeah, all cars being built today will be in the field for at least a decade. Um, so we already need to build post-quantum in a couple of years ago, otherwise we're too late. So that is exactly what we have been doing. And now I lost the clicker. Yes. So there are m multiple potential problems uh, or challenges we need to look at. One is key sizes, uh, performance, of course, and memory usage. And as we saw yesterday, performance in many cases is, I mean, not that much of an impact. There is an impact. Um, but yeah, since we're talking embedded and hardware, we can always cheat there. We can always add hardware coprocessors um, to deal with this lack of performance, but yeah, I want to make clear that the biggest challenge actually to get post-quantum crypto migration ongoing to embedded devices is uh, the memory usage. And then I have one slide about that, and then for the remainder I want to focus on uh, high security implementations, which is completely a different security model which folks, which run for instance TLS, uh, care about. So maybe first it's good to take a step back and what is embedded? What do I even mean with this? Um, and it's quite different to what, for instance, NIST defined as embedded. So on the NIST mailing list, a couple of years back, there was a discussion what is embedded, and I think it was driven from the academic community, and they decided let's go for a Cortex-M4 um, and take this as an embedded, as the default embedded platform. It had yeah, 196 kilobytes of RAM and a megabyte of flash ROM. And for us, this is super high-end. Um, this is really typically not what we consider uh, as embedded. Just to give an example, typical uh, devices um, f in our low power uh, range for edge computing range from 8 to 60 megahertz. They have 4 to 16 kilobyte of uh, SRAM, and then the flash is typically 16 to 32K. So this is really significantly uh, lower uh, than, than what, what is considered in many of the academic publications. And then, so work um, we did with Ember, who is somewhere in the room here, uh, as an intern at NXP, we managed to look and try to see how much can we get this memory down. Because here, if you look at just, we take the best implementation, C only, of dilithium um, aimed at em embedded devices from uh, PQ Clean. Um, and then we see the three algorithms, so uh, uh, generating keys, sign, and verify. Then you see the memory consumption uh, under a uh, kilobyte and the performance uh, in thousands of cycles. 
And then it becomes clear that if you look, for instance, at Sign or Verify, they need more than, than 70 or 50 kilobytes of memory that's excluding storing the, the signatures or reading the signature in or ex excluding reading in the keys. This is really the memory you need on top when processing or running the algorithm. And if you map this to the requirements I have on top, it's already clear that, I mean, simply no way that this will fit. So we, yeah, embarked on this quest to see how much lower can we push this memory down, uh, even by trading in, so doing time memory trade-offs, trading memory uh, for performance. And then you see some of our initial results um, below here. And then it becomes clear that, for instance, if we're interested in Verify, which is typical application for secure boot, and secure update, we can get for dilithium-3 even below three kilobytes. So this is really a significant reduction, but of course we pay the price that it's roughly twice as slow. But this is already to indicate that for embedded, there are a lot more uh, things to play with and other things which are important, because if you're in the cloud in high-end uh, situations, of course you have many gigabytes of RAM, so you really don't care about this. Some performance, and I don't want to go into detail, I think yesterday we had a great talk about the performance um, of different schemes. So these are just performance numbers um, I took online, so they're not from us, so they're from uh, the PQM4 benchmarking framework. I think the, the main takeaways are that in terms of performance, and then you can compare light blues, RSA, um, ECC is dark blue, and the green is, is, is dilithium, that the performance is actually better. Um, and, but the big problem, as we saw yesterday, is in the key sizes, right? And I think that is the big challenge. In terms of performance, if we're starting to do these tricks, as I showed in the previous slide, trading performance for memory, um, of course, then the memory can go down, but performance goes up. But most of the runtime, and I think that was a question yesterday, in the post-quantum crypto schemes is actually spent in Ketchak, so in, in the core of SHA-3. Um, 80 to 90% of the runtime, depending which algorithm you exactly look at. Um, similar for LMS and XMSS. And of course, that is a massive opportunity for us to add dedicated SHA-3 or Ketchak hardware um, to actually speed all this up. And then if we look at an overview with a similar slide as this one yesterday, but you will see the colors are now a bit different because this is really looking at things from the embedded point of view. And um, so here it is just embedded plus signatures. Um, the top row is, is ECC, just for uh, comparison for, for the sizes. And then again, yeah, as you can see, there is no row which is all green, same as yesterday. Um, but yeah, for Falcon, it is clear the sizes are a bit better than for dilithium. But I think there, and we go to this in the next couple of slides, um, if you need s signing, um, you are simply out of luck with Falcon. First of all, you need uh, double precision, which many of our embedded devices do not even have. Yesterday it was mentioned it's very difficult to do it securely. I'm saying many embedded devices don't even have this unit. So and there's no way. Then you can try to emulate this, of course, with fixed point arithmetic or other tricks. Um, but then we need to do everything in uh, high secure implementations. So protect against advanced side channel attacks. That will be the remainder uh, of this presentation. And then I think, yeah, we don't know. It's an open problem, actually, how to do this for Falcon. So that's why if you need to sign for embedded Falcon, it's simply not an option. For verification, of course, it's perfectly fine. Um, there, there's really no issue. But that's why we see a lot of our customers, they either go for LMS and XMSS, so the stateful schemes, or they prefer dilithium. So then let's talk about side channels and something yeah, we also talked about before, which we call the Evocalypse. Um, some interesting property we have in many of the post-quantum crypto schemes, which has a significant impact um, on yeah, side channel protection. So maybe for people who are not familiar what are side channel uh, attacks um, or fault attacks, so they're <coughs> Passive or active attacks you can run on a device, which typically you have in your hand. It's not uh, necessary, but take, for instance, your phone, your passport, or your credit card. There's a chip inside, and this chip might run crypto. 
Um, and if it's running crypto and you can measure some meta information, for instance, the power um, or the time it runs uh, or the radiation, you can use this to deduce information about the key used in that crypto algorithm. And if you do this in a passive way, it's called a side channel attack. If you do this in an active way, for instance, you start to shoot lasers at your chip to produce a faulty outcome. And from this faulty outcome, you can deduce information about the secret key used. Um, then that's called a fault injection. And this is a very active field of research with many, many different types of attacks. Um, and it's very well known how to protect against this for, for instance, ECC or for RSA. And now the big question, of course, is do the same countermeasures apply to the post-quantum crypto schemes as well? So yeah, what is the situation uh, with post-quantum crypto? And to understand the problem I want to introduce, um, you need to know something uh, about what I said is the FO transform of the Fujisako Okamoto transform. And that's the transformation used um, in virtually all of the, the post-quantum crypto key exchange schemes. Um, and yeah, it's a theoretical construction which allows you to have a scheme in one security model to convert it um, into a scheme in a different, a better uh, security model. I would don't want to go into all the theoretical details, but the idea is that you have a ciphertext, that's the C on the left, you do your decryption with your secret key, you get the plain text, and then you re-encrypt this plain text, and then you get, again, a ciphertext, and then you compare these two, um, and if everything is fine, you continue. So what is now the problem? So if we want to attack this with a side channel attack, there are many ways how to do it. And one way is that you can do a chosen plain text attack. So what does it mean? The attacker chooses a, a plain text. He encrypts this plain text. Uh, and this plain text was carefully made in such a way that if you run your decryption um, and you do, a, for instance, a power analysis, you might learn some specific bits of your secret key. So it was very carefully crafted. Um, but since this is a valid plain text and you encrypt it, you get a valid ciphertext. Um, so you have a valid ciphertext and you have a plain text which is known by the attacker because it was carefully crafted by him. And that means that if you are now want to protect your implementation, you need to protect your decryption box on the left uh, and everything on the right is public. You don't need to protect it against side channel attacks. Um, since the, the plain text is public, so if you do your encryption there with your public key, that's perfectly fine. So this is very much the same situation as we have with ECC and RSA nowadays. So if this was the entire story, we would be perfectly fine and happy. Um, so we, yeah, it's important now you only need to protect the CPA decryption, so the box on the left. Now what you can do um, is another type of attack. Now you don't choose the plain text, but you carefully choose the ciphertext. So this means that the ciphertext might not even correspond to any meaningful plain text, but this ciphertext was just chosen that if the CPA decryption box starts to compute on it with your secret key and you start to measure this, you learn some information uh, about the secret key. But it might also be then that if you get your plain text out, that, and then the CPA encryption starts to process on this plain text that you want to protect this as well because this plain text value actually is now secret as well because you didn't start from the plain text, you started from a chosen ciphertext. So computations on this plain text might now leak in turn information about the secret key as well. And what does this mean? This means that now we do not only need to protect the CPA decryption, but we also need to protect everything on the right-hand side as well. So the whole CPA encryption and the computations on your public key now become sensitive. And this is very different um, to what we're used to with ECC and RSA, because now suddenly we need to protect much, much more. Um, and this has an impact on your runtime, on your size of your implementation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I will show that in the next slides. So this was first observed uh, in 2020. Uh, in the context of Frodochem, but it applies uh, generically to all uh, constructions like Kyber, who use the FO transform. 
Um, and I think, yeah, this is a massive impact. People have showed that protected implementations can easily be broken by only a couple of thousand traces. So what is a trace? It's that you take, for instance, a power measurement of the algorithm running, um, and then you repeat that because you want to cancel out noise. And typically, you want to protect at, say, an X amount of traces, where X is in the order of magnitude of a million. So a thousand is really, really low. So why is this so bad? Because there are now post-quantum crypto algorithms, as we saw yesterday, are already much more complicated, much larger than uh, ECC and RSA, which are small and simple. So there are much more potential points of interest to attack and measure. Now, if you have two of these large functions, you double your attack surface even further. And moreover, it's very easy to build templates. So that is something you can do offline, and then your online phase uh, becomes extremely easy. And for instance, yeah, this is what I mentioned. With only 15,000 traces, um, it was shown that a mask, so a protected kyber, um, could easily be broken. So yeah, we looked at this in more detail. So what does this mean in practice? So for ECC and RSA, typically, so in the pre-quantum setting, um, you would start to mask um, your implementation. So what does masking mean? It's if you work on a sensitive value, so if you work on something which rel relates information to your secret key, you would take a random value and then you would mask it. So you would split your sensitive value into multiple shares and then work on these shares independently. And you can prove that in certain security models, it depends uh, how many traces one allows to collect, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But this will offer you security. And typically, um, we are working with uh, two or three shares uh, in practice uh, for ECC and RSA. This has, of course, a big impact, because if you have a value um, which is, let's say, 32 bytes, and you need to protect it with two shares, it's now represented into two times 32 bytes. But this is with ECC. If we go to something like Kyber, we work with polynomials. Polynomials uh, are of degree 256. Um, but we need to store these values with uh, 32 bits. So it means that every polynomial is one kilobyte, thus just to represent one intermediate variable. If we now need to split this into two or three parts, it blows up our memory consumption again. So we, again, have this problem I showed in the beginning, um, that we yeah, have problems running this on embedded devices for high secure uh, applications. So what do we see here in this graph? So you see on the x-axis the number of shares. You, so every sensitive variable and how many shares you put this. On the y-axis, you see the number uh, of traces um, we allow an attacker to collect. And then you see these two different scenarios, the, the known ciphertext or the chosen plaintext uh, and, and the chosen ciphertext. So the two attacks I showed before. And it simply means that if we consider yeah, the best attack, so the orange one, um, yeah, you need to um, simply split it in much more shares if you take your threshold at, for instance, a million traces. Of course, there are, this is very simplified. There are, um, your platform has some noise. Um, so for low noise, there's a certain scenario for higher noise. But it means that just because of this problem with the uh, FO transform, the, it results in practice that we need to increase the number of shares we need by either uh, one or two. And they are already, as you can see, depending if you're in low noise or high no noise scenario, but in the worst case, we now need to go from two to three shares to eight shares in practice, which means that everything becomes at least eight times slower and requires eight times more memory if you want a secure implementation as used, for instance, uh, on your credit card. So to conclude, because I'm not going to present a solution because I don't have one, uh, that, <laughs> that is the sad news. People chose this FO transform because it has these nice theoretical properties. Um, and it is a very nice construction, but it has this nasty side effect um, when you want to protect against um, such side channel attacks or fault injections. So yeah, we are, have been working on this really hard the last years. As I said, we have been preparing this for, for many years now um, because we already have hardware solutions and software solutions for industrial, uh, IoT, and automotive. Um, to conclude, 
I think, yeah, it's always interesting. We, the pres we had the presentation yesterday about risk management. I think from a very pragmatic industrial point of view, it's completely irrelevant. We have very concrete timelines when the standards are coming out. Our customers demand that we comply with these standards and hence we just need to provide uh, high secure solutions. And we have very concrete timelines and then it's irrelevant if we believe that a quantum computer is out in five years, 10 years or 15 years. Um, so we see, of course, already in the last five years, quite some requests. This got ramped up in the summer of last year significantly, of course, after the finalists were announced. And I expect an exponential growth in requests that people want a solution yesterday uh, when the standards are officially released. For embedded applications, there are lots of challenges. Performance, memory and key size, where I definitely think that memory is the, is the, the top one, especially if we want to move from functional implementations to high assurance implementations. Um, and that leads to the question, of course, can we do other things than masking, for instance, uh, or other ways of masking to protect against uh, side channel attacks? Main takeaway, same as people mentioned yesterday, think about your migration path, especially when you're in the embedded sphere. What does this mean for your deployed products? Can they be upgraded in the field? That relates to all the crypto agility. Um, and of course, when, if you're a cryptographer, as usual, it's very exciting times to work on all of this. Thank you very much. So uh, we already have two questions from online. So also feel free to go to uh, our website. Uh, uh, that's uh, 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 pkic.org slash ask to, to submit questions. So the, the questions that we have online are, uh, any idea of the market size estimate of quantum safe migration of embedded devices? I mean, it, it touches the entire ecosystem, right? So I don't know in, in if the market size you want to know it in, in, in dollars, but uh, I'm not the best person to ask that. But what we see is, especially due to CNSA 2, where for firmware uh, updates, they need to be migrated in 25. Our US customers are getty, getting very worried and want to migrate now. Um, so that's not, a yeah, not an answer to the market size itself, but it's more related to the urgency for the migration. Um, and we see the same with the transition guidelines of Germany and France, for instance, in Europe. I think between 25 and 35, we will see a massive transition. For new products, it's, of course, easier than for um, currently de deployed products, but there, most of them can be updated in the field. If not, indeed, then you need to have a plan how to replace these uh, in time. Yeah, and that's actually what the, the, the second question is about. What about IoT or other devices critical for, in for, for critical infrastructure uh, to start using these new algorithms, but they are hard to replace, uh, either high in the sky or... Uh, yeah, so then, I mean, there are for automotive, for instance, um, we have solutions where you can go to your garage and, and do an update, a secure update there. Um, of course, for IoT devices or industrial devices, it's a bit more complicated. For many, we already have deployed post-quantum secure update solutions for the devices in the field. But let's be honest, not all devices have uh, an, an update mechanism. So then it, yeah, you need to continue to use your device until the end of lifetime and then replace it. And I fully realize that not for all scenarios um, that is a viable solution. For smart cards, for instance, it is. Um, it's perfectly fine if you have a smart card deployed now and it reaches end of life and is replaced, let's say, in five years. Um, but yeah, if you have, like in the financial industry, in your ATMs and you need to really do a hardware update, I think, like we see now, that triple desk is still used. It's much more complicated. Okay, thank you. Any question from the audience? <laughs> Um, I was wondering, like, if we would look in hindsight in, in from this competition, are there alternatives to the FO transform that would have been better to use instead of the regular FO transform? Yeah, so the question was if, if in hindsight there were other constructions than the FO transform to achieve the same thing, but which would have helped the embedded world a bit better. Um, that's a very good question. So I'm not... 
a crypto theory person. I asked this question to some of the, the theory experts, like in CWI, for instance, there are people who work on, on, on theory behind the AFO transform, and they were, I asked them two years ago, they were not even aware of all these more practical implications. So that already shows you the unfortunate disconnect between theory and practice. Um, but no, I'm not aware of any constructions. Um, the good news is that if we would have found something last year, we probably could have replaced things quite easily, but now the standards are being drafted and out soon, and I, I don't think it's realistic to assume things will change in the standards. Okay, L let's say thank uh, Joppa again. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.